So welcome to today's Ethics and the 21st Century Challenges Seminar Series. My name is um, Julian Savalescu. I'm the Director of the Institute for Science and Ethics. And uh, it's been a great pleasure to be involved in this series examining uh, the ethical implications and engaging in an ethical discourse around some of the very exciting work going on in the Oxford Martin School. Today it's a great pleasure to welcome Professors Liam Dolan and Jane Langdale, the co-directors of the Plants for the 21st Century Institute within the Martin School. And they will talk, uh, as you'll see, on ethics and plant science, improving food yields in a changing environment. Thanks very much, Julian. Jane and I are going to talk more about the genetics and the plant science side, and we're hoping that maybe the ethics will come out in the discussion subsequently. So if we think about the food that we eat today, the majority of it is the result of at least two revolutions. One of these revolutions was the domestication of plants. This was the process that occurred thousands of years ago in different parts of the world that transformed those wild, weedy species into the crops that we know today. And that's exemplified here by uh, maize. So maize is derived from this wild ancestor, Teosinte, from Central America. And over years of cultivation and domestication, this weedy plant with very small flowers that produce very hard seeds inside tough casings was transformed into the, the cob of corn that we know today, which has very accessible forms of high uh, calorific uh, foodstuff. And this domestication took place throughout the world and continued uh, until over around 100 years ago. And then as world populations increased through the 20th century, there was another revolution. And that revolution was the, the Green Revolution. And the Green Revolution increased yields dramatically. And those yields were increased through the application of high levels of relatively cheap fertilizer. So it became relatively cheap to apply large amounts of fertilizers to fields. And then these fields, uh, if planted with new varieties of plants that carry these semi-dwarf genes, so this is the type of wheat that might have been grown around Britain um, around 100 years ago, so it would have been this high. Now if you walk through a wheat field or a barley field uh, um, in the summer, um, most of it won't come up far uh, above your knee. So this combination of innovations, genetic innovation, along with the innovations that arose from the Industrial Revolution, uh, gave rise to the, the Green Revolution, which is dramatically increase the yield. So on this panel here, I'm showing you the, the yield increases in wheat that we saw in a period between 1950 and 2000. But we need to change the way we do agriculture for reasons that uh, are clear to many people. One is there's a rising population. Two is we've got no more land to uh, put under the plough. And thus far, the uh, the way we carry out agriculture is unsustainable. It's largely polluting, it's using uh, resources that uh, are about to run out, and it causes huge amounts of greenhouse gases emissions, both in the production of fertilizers, but even agriculture itself, the act of plowing up fields, or what happens to fertilizers after they're applied to soils. So we need another revolution, and Jonathan Lynch has called this the second green revolution. And he's exemplified this with this curve here. So um, in this curve, it's a, these are axes that in here indicate uh, yield, and here we got soil fertility. This could be soil fertility, or it could be water. It could be any of the many inputs that we use in agriculture. And curve one represents the very first plants. These were the domesticated plants. So these plants, as in soil fertility increased, the yield increased, uh, but then it reached a plateau very early, and then uh, the yields dropped off. So they didn't respond positively to soil fertility. The key of the green revolution was indicated uh, in these plants represented by curve two. Plants of the green revolution were able to respond to fertilizer. So in some respects, the more fertilizer you applied to these fields, the greater the yields until ultimately there was a plateau. And so theoretically, where we want to be heading in future is not along any of these two curves, but Jonathan has suggested that we want a curve that starts somewhere in here. 
This, in this region of the curve, we've got relatively high yields with relatively low inputs. So somehow we've got to produce more with less. And the technologies that Jane and I will talk about today, uh, many of them can, in principle, raise these curves from down here to in here. They can also raise these curves uh, from here to here also. But the, if you want to take away the aim of much of the research that we're trying to do, it's focused in here. And so this will involve uh, developing technologies that will enhance the efficiency whereby plants take nutrients out of the soil, technologies that protect plants from disease, and technologies that enhance the photosynthetic <coughs> capacity of plants. And that's the capacity of plants to use the sun's energy to transform carbon dioxide into energy-rich sugars. Now, at the basis of everything that we do is genetics. These first farmers were geneticists. They didn't call themselves geneticists, but they looked for natural variation, and then they continuously selected for variants that were, uh, um, that were advantageous to agriculture. And we're doing exactly the same. We're looking at plants, looking for traits, and we now have at our disposal technologies that allows us to manipulate those genes in a variety of ways to try to raise uh, this curve, to head towards curve three. And as most of you will know, genes reside in DNA. So each of us got packets of DNA from both of our parents. The DNA is located in chromosomes. And we can unravel this DNA in chromosomes. And different lengths of string uh, are the locations of genes. So this string is a series of genes side by side. And what geneticists can do is they can find various ways to move these pieces of string around from organism to organism, putting them together in combinations that will give desirable traits. And one way in which this has been done uh, very effectively in, from the late 90s was to help uh, conserve the papaya industry in Hawaii. So for many years, papaya ring spot disease had been uh, infecting uh, papaya plants, had been dramatically reducing yields. And in the 90s, it was thought that perhaps <coughs> the end of the papaya industry was in sight unless something could be done. And uh, there was... Uh, this is what the papaya ring spot does. So this is a, a healthy papaya tree. This is a papaya uh, seriously in stress after infection with the, the ring spot virus. Um, but viruses contain their own nucleic acid, just like our DNA. And it's been possible to develop technologies that manipulates the nucleic acid, the, the genetic material of the virus, to generate plants that are resistant to, to infection. And so the, this technology is to uh, take uh, part of the genome, the nucleic acid, the genetic material of the virus, introduce it into the papaya plant. And so the papaya plant is now producing a protein uh, from the virus. The introduction of the genetic material induces an immune response in the plant. And as a result, there's a constitutive activation of an immune response against this virus. And the virus, the plant, is then resistant uh, to infection. So this technology uh, has um, allowed the recovery of the papaya industry. And now approximately 80% of the papaya grown in Hawaii uh, carries, uh, is, um, is genetically modified plants harboring this technology that's uh, allowing the sustainability of, the, of, of this industry. Um, so that's a, a developed world example that's uh, deemed to have been successful. Uh, these technologies can also be applied to the developing world, and cotton production is a major uh, uh, agricultural activity in, in India. And India, cotton production the world over has traditionally utilized large amounts of pesticides in order to get an adequate yield. And the reason is there are large numbers of insects that basically eat the bowl. They eat the structure that produces uh, the cotton. And so here we've got a larvae of one of these uh, organisms. And it turns out that there are bacteria, soil bacteria, that produce proteins uh, 
that are toxic to these larvae. And the isolation of the genes encoding these proteins, so it's the genetic material that controls the production of these toxins, and these toxins are called cry toxins, can be introduced into the plant. And so the way this is done is the nucleic acid, the genetic material from the bacteria, is fused to a piece of genetic material from the plant that results in the bacterial protein being produced in the developing bowl. And as a result, this pesticidal bacteria is produced in the plant and preserves the, 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 the plant from uh, the infestation. So this technology has been utilized around the world. It was first introduced in the United States in 1997. So these are field tests. We've got uh, millions of hectares of uh, planted uh, BT cotton uh, here. Uh, this is time. So these are field trials released in 1997 in the United States, and it's been on an upward trajectory ever since. It's been introduced to India since 2002 and has <laughs> continued to increase. And now uh, between uh, 90 and 93 percent of the cotton acreage in India is uh, BT cotton. And uh, it has dramatically uh, improved uh, crop yields uh, uh, on, on mass. So, uh, for example, this is illustrated here. So these are studies that are based on Indian yeah. cotton production. And if we look at crop loss, so that's the amount of crops that are lost due to the, uh, the pest in the absence of ex uh, insecticide. So here's insecticide applied here, and this is crop loss. So if we apply no insecticide, we lose almost 80% of the normal cotton crop but we only lose about 25% of the genetically modified cotton crop. And we see this benefit of BT cotton even with quite high levels uh, of applied pesticide. So this has led to a reduction globally of pesticide uh, production, uh, of pesticide application uh, during the cultivation uh, of cotton. And a number of studies have been done to try to determine who's actually benefiting from this technology. Because there, while clearly the large companies that are producing this technology are benefiting, but how far down through the economic chain is benefit perceived? And so this is a, 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 a measure of this uh, reported uh, in a review of uh, three years ago. And what we can see here is compared BT cotton to conventional cotton production, and this is change in US dollars in income. So in total, uh, in, over the first few years of the introduction of cotton, incomes have increased. And this has been spread, uh, as you might expect, uh, among rich farmers. For me, it was unexpected to see that vulnerable farmers were considerably benefiting from it. Uh, but poor farmers, and so these would be farmers who'd f farm two to four, uh, sorry, two to three hectares in India, were also uh, seeing some benefit from this technology. And for me, what was even more uh, surprising was that there was a, a, an observable benefit to landless labour. So these were people who didn't own land in India, but who uh, saw benefit. And one of the reasons is it's many of these. Uh, landless labour who pick the cotton and there's disproportionate representation of women there. So the slight increase in benefit that's accruing to the, poor, the poorest is largely accruing to the, the women uh, of that community. So one of the projects that we've got uh, uh, going on as part of our uh, Martin School project is with the Biodiversity Institute and Carla is sitting here who's just on her way to India. So one of the things that we want to do is to evaluate the effects of genetically modified BT cotton uh, on ecosystem service provision in India because this is very topical at the moment because uh, the Indian government has placed an indefinite moratorium on what was to be the second genetically modified plant. This is BT Brinjal or aubergine. Um, and what uh, Carla's project is, is to, the aim of Carla's project is to, is to determine are there any, is there any reason to believe any of the scaremongering rumours that, uh, uh, that permeate the, the media but haven't uh, been uh, substantiated by anything in the scientific literature. So we're looking at this from, from, from two angles. So these were two examples from pests. 
And I said that there are other ways in which we can begin to move this slide, uh, this curve uh, um, upwards. And in one of these ways is to enhance the, the efficiency or the ability of crops to take up fertiliser. So if I tell you that when we uh, apply uh, phosphate fertiliser to fields in UK fields, um, uh, in UK agriculture, 90% of that applied phosphate is not taken up by the plant. It goes, it runs into the water system or becomes tightly bound up to the soil. So there's definitely mileage there to increase phosphate uptake efficiency. Nitrogen is even more alarming. So it's uh, between 80 and 90%, but the costs of producing nitrogen are hugely more expensive, hugely larger than phosphate. So our plants that we grow today have been bred in conditions where they've had large amounts of fertilizer applied. And in many respects, they may have lost the ability to, uh, the, the very efficient, uh, they may have lost the ability to efficiently extract nutrient from conditions when they're from the soil when there's little of that nutrient <coughs> around. So one of the projects that we're doing as part of the Martin School funding is to try to enhance nutrient uptake efficiency in crops. And the way we do that is we use our fundamental knowledge of root system development. So we've identified genes that we know are re required for the formation of the surface layer of the root that forms these root hairs. Root hairs are important for nutrient uptake because they enhance, increase the um, surface area of the root. And we've identified these genes by doing old-fashioned um, mutagenesis, identifying mutants that don't have root hair. So here's a mutant that lacks a root hair. This is the wild-type parent. We've identified the DNA sequence that corresponds to this gene, and this gives us a tool with which we can now begin to manipulate root function. And one of the experiments that we've done is to introduce the a hyperactive version of the rice RSL gene uh, into rice. So this is um, a wild type rice, and you see it's got quite short root hairs. Here's a rice plant that's been genetically modified to contain its own rice gene, but in a hyperactive form. And you can see that these are producing very long root hairs. So having identified this regulator of root development, we can now manipulate it to produce these plants that should, in principle, have increased ability to take up nutrient. And the data I'm about to show is all preliminary data, and this is preliminary data from Chu Min Kim, who's sitting uh, in the audience. And so what we have here is a pair of uh, experiments. Uh, this is a wild-type plant. We can see it's quite slight compared to the plant next to it, which harbors this uh, root hair regulatory gene. These are grown in identical conditions. What I want you to see is that the plant that's been transformed with the gene is much bulkier and bigger. And we've done this independently using another rice gene. So this seems to be telling us that we can manipulate the ability of roots to take up nutrients. Um, we've also tried this experiment uh, in a relative of wheat to see how general it is. And so here we've got our control plant, so this hasn't been genetically modified. And then here these two, three plants here have, are expressing a version of this gene which uh, enhances their growth. And we're testing the hypothesis that it's doing this through enhancing increased nutrient uptake efficiency from the soil. Okay, and at that stage, I'm going to hand over to Jane. Okay, so what Liam's just talked to you about are what we would call relatively simple cases. Every example he talked about was essentially just taking a single gene from one species and putting it into another. What I'm going to do is use some examples to illustrate the complexities around not just the science of trying to generate these crops, but also the political, economic, and other regulatory complexities around the, uh, the whole process. And using examples of late blight resistant potato, golden rice, C4 rice, and submergence tolerance rice. And as a segue from Liam to myself, I just thought we'd start with the late blight resistant potato. 
And this is actually a monument that is still stood in a high-profile position in Ireland, reminding everybody of Britain's genocide by starvation during the Irish famine and the Irish Holocaust caused by the politics in the UK at the time. And I just put that up to point out that politics has a very important part to play as we go forward, just as it did back then. So late blight is called, caused by Phytophthora infestans. And why would we want a late blight resistant potato? Well, essentially, this schematic shows you the number of times in a season that regular potatoes are treated with fungicide. And it can be up to 12 applications a year. So everywhere there's a P here, there is a stage where Phytophthora can infect the crop and the fungicide is applied. To date, most farmers don't actually think there's an issue here. They think they have a chemical arsenal that can deal with late blight and so are not particularly um, proactive or supportive about people who are trying to breed late blight potatoes because they think they can deal with it chemically. So how can you go about making a late blight resistant potato? Well, this is a key photograph because what this shows is different species of selenium, potato relatives, growing in a field that has been infected by Phytophthora. And you can see that some of the plants are perfectly healthy. They're not affected by the fungus at all, whereas some are. And one particular species is this one here, Solanum venturii, and it is totally resistant to the late blight fungus. And so work that's been carried out by Jonathan Jones in the Sainsbury Lab at Norwich has actually taken, first of all, identified the resistance gene in Solanum venturia and put it into our regular Solanum tuberosum. And what you see here is Desiree, which is a, a variety of potato that we're all familiar with. And you can see on the top here are leaves of the transgenic plant that have been infected with Phytophthora and leaves of the non-transgenic plant. And so it's quite easy to see that the introduction of this single gene from a wild relative of potato has conferred resistance against late blight. Jonathan took this into field trials in 2010 and again in 2012. And this is what the potato, this is a mixed population of transgenic and non-transgenic <coughs> plants in June when the late blight fungus is not around. And as by the name suggests, it comes later in the season. And you can see that in August, when the Phytophthora has come in, here's the non-transgenic Desiree potatoes, and here are the ones containing the single transgene. So this seems like a solution to late blight. Well, Jonathan's not the only one who's been generating these uh, sorts of lines. BAS, BASF, the chemical company, generated an equivalent variety using resistance genes from a different wild relative of potato, and they called it Fortuna. And they produced this pamphlet saying why Fortuna was a good thing. They themselves, who produced chemicals, pointed out that instead of having to put uh, fungicides on 12 times a year, there would still probably have to be two applications for a different fungus, but the chemical input would be drastically reduced if Fortuna was adopted. Well, EU regulatory bodies refused to adopt Fortuna. So that was in 2011 when they applied for uh, permission to grow it and commercialize it. They were refused it, they appealed against it, and they were refused it again. And so, what's the outcome? The outcome was that due to lack of acceptance of these crops, BASF decided to stop any commercial activities in Europe and they moved their corporate headquarters from Germany to the USA. Clear economic impact of that decision. And so what we have here is nine years of research and development, including six years of field trials, and still no crop in the field. So that's the first example that I'm going to use to illustrate some of these issues. The second one is golden rice. And golden rice has essentially been modified so that it will incorporate vitamin A in the seed. Why would we want to do that? The reason is that every year, over half a million children under five die of vitamin A deficiency and another 350,000 <coughs> go blind. Seems a pretty powerful and compelling argument to try and provide a food, uh, food for them that can uh, do something about that. A lot of these children are in Asia and most of their diet is based on rice. And this is just a chemical pathway that you don't need to take much notice of except to notice that this is the product that allows uh, vitamin A to be formed and in the rice grain there is a block here. The enzyme that does this very first step does not 
perform its activity in the rice grain. It's present in the rice leaf, in the rice shoot, so rice can complete this pathway, but this enzyme's not present in the grain, and as a consequence, the, white, the rice is white. Ingo Patricus, many years ago, decided that he would try and manipulate this pathway, and in 2000, they published a paper where they showed that they could essentially, by introducing two enzymes, this one and one other one, uh, they used an enzyme from daffodil and an enzyme from a soil bacterium to do it, they could push this pathway through in the seed. And they, what they made was golden rice version one. There was a problem with it though, you needed to eat three kilograms of it a day to get your recommended daily amount of vitamin A. But it was a step in the right direction. <coughs> And three or four years later, there was a version two developed where you only needed to eat 150 grams, which is, in the, it was, it is within the uh, sort of range of what children are eating in Asia. So, fantastic. We've got rice. We can give it to children. We can prevent blindness. And this was, remember, 2000, a few years later, uh, the, the second version. This was the cover of Time magazine in July 2000. This is Inga Patrikas. He'd retired at that point. He'd been retired a year. This rice could save a million kids a year, but protesters believe its genetically modified foods are bad for us. And he had a huge problem convincing any of the regulators that this rice should be approved for uh, even field trials. And one of the things he used on his website, and I think there's still a website that has it on, is this figure here. And what this shows is the pathway to generating a version of rice called IR64 that millions and millions of us eat. And every step in this pathway, where there's a yellow arrow, a different parent, a gen different genetic resource has been crossed to the line that was being bred. And what he was trying to point out here is that by the time you get to this, we have absolutely no idea what genes have been brought in from other related rice varieties. There's no tracking of it. We don't know how many there are. We don't know what they are. But we're all happy to eat this rice. And so he tried to make this point, um, and this essentially is what happened, to give you a timeline. He started this project in 1990, and as I said, they published Golden Rice 1 in 1999, 2000. In 2000, and this had taken five or six years, they finally negotiated a public-private partnership because in order to actually produce the golden rice, they'd had to use, they'd had to use 70 or, or deal with 70 enabling patents. And so they had to come up with a public-private partnership which would dis effectively say that none of those original patents could take any claim on profit from this because it was being done as a, as a public benefit project. It was another three years before the first line was approved by regulatory bodies, and then another year later, a clean line, as they call it, was approved for field trials in the US, which is not where they need it. That was the same year as Golden Rice 2 was generated. It then took another five years before there could be a regulatory framework put together to let it to be grown in Asia. So that was that was agreed in 2009, but it was still another two years before the first field trials were carried out in the Philippines at the International Rice Research Institute. They were successful, and there was a big press release that the first golden rice was going to be grown as a crop in the Philippines in 2012 for human consumption. And we thought we were finally on the way. What happened last year across the Philippines, not just in the fields that were growing golden rice, was that yields were only two-thirds of the previous season. Because the yields of the golden rice were two-thirds of what had been predicted or expected, essentially it has not, not, yet, been re re not yet been released to other countries. And they have going through another trial in the Philippines this year, because if the yields are only two-thirds, then farmers won't grow it because they need quantity rather than the quality of this. So we are still 23 years on from the initial start of the project, and very few people have yet benefited from this product. OK, so that was the second example. The third example is still essentially in progress, very much in progress, work that's being done in my lab and many others, 
uh, as part of the P21C. <coughs> and this is a project aimed to increase, improve photosynthesis in rice. And so without going into the details, rice is essentially what's known as a C3 plant. And this is an example of it growing in a field right next to maize, which uses a different form of photosynthesis known as C4. And this in between it is a weed that also uses C4 photosynthesis. And it's not difficult to see that the biomass produced by the C4 plants is much greater. And because it's estimated that rice yields need to increase by 50% by 2050 to cope with Asia's population rise, there is an effort to try and convert rice into a C4 photosynthetic plant. So how can we do that? Well, this is definitely not a single gene. It's not even two genes like golden rice. This is going to require that we change the anatomy of the leaves, we change the biochemistry of the leaves, and then we kind of do a bit of fine tuning, and we might get a C4 rice. Why do we think we can do this? We think we can do this because C4 evolved from C3 on at least 50 times independently, and so there is precedent in evolution that it can be done, and it can be done relatively easily. However, right now, we don't even know how the anatomy develops in a C4 plant, let alone how to change it in a C3. So this project has taken a huge amount of investment by people and by, in particular, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a belief that it is worth trying, even if it's not going to be successful. And there is a multinational consortium, of which we're part, right in the centre of this picture. <laughs> um, phase one was carried out uh, from 2009 to 2012. It involved 16 institutions, nine countries, and $11 million, all supplied by the Gates Foundation. Progress was such that it was deemed worthy of renewal for phase two, and phase two funding was released in May this year, another $12.5 million. And in this particular tranche of funding, DFID or UK Aid have also contributed to it. So what's the timeline? Well, this is the very optimistic timeline. We're here in phase two, three years for phase two. It's going to be 15 years minimum before we even know whether we can do it let alone introduce it with regulatory bodies, etc. So this is a long-term, high investment, very high-profile project now, uh, particularly in Asia, but also uh, in the States. And it's, well, well, watch this space. The Martin School is centrally involved in this. So I just want to end with an example that's slightly different. And it's an example that we're all very aware of and we all incorporate into our thinking about how to move forward. And this is an example of what's called sub submergence tolerant rice. So why on earth, most of you are probably thinking, do we want rice that is submergence tolerant when it's grown in paddy fields most of the time anyway? Well, the bottom line is that rice is okay growing in water as long as it isn't completely submerged. If it gets completely submerged, it tries to get itself out of it and it extends its stems rapidly and then, if it's a flood and the flood recedes, the tall, skinny plants that have grown out of the water fall over and die. And essentially, in India and Bangladesh, they lose 4 million tonnes of rice a year to floods. So this is not paddy field rice, this is rain-fed rice. So, back in the early 19... No, late 1990s, sorry, there was a group at UC Davis who identified a variety of rice, a very low-yielding variety of rice, that was tolerant to those floods. And they showed that they could flood it, and it was resistant. It didn't go through that elongation response. It didn't try to grow out of the water when the floods came. And after some time, they identified a single locus in that variety that was responsible for that response, that <coughs> failure to grow out of the water. And they introduced it into regular varieties of rice and showed that if they had that gene, then they too were able to tolerate the floods. Rather than have to deal with the regulatory bodies, what they then did was go back and they did a series of back crossings to introduce the specific locus from this donor into the high yielding rice varieties. And what they were able to do was produce a variety of rice that had had this allele introduced by conventional breeding, 
and was thus now high yielding and flood resistant. And this also had a reasonably long timeline in as much as the fundamental discovery of that genetic locus took her first in 1995. They were able to, between 1995 and 2006, they were able to show using GM varieties that these things were <coughs> submergent tolerant. But by 2006, the breeders at the Rice Research Institute in the Philippines had generated a variety through conventional uh, crossing. The field trials were uh, first conducted in 2007. And in 2011, over one million farmers in India and Bangladesh actually planted the seed. So in this case, we had 13 years to the field and 15 years to an awful lot of people actually having that food on their table. And so this was much faster because there were no regulatory bodies to deal with. And so I'm just going to end with this picture, oops, no, not this, with the, just a, a slide showing these timelines, just to sort of hammer home, even with the best intentions, how long these things take. And I've also added in here one. Some of you may have bought Beneforti broccoli at Marks and Spencer's when it was released <coughs> last year. Um, that took 26 years to get into Marks and Spencer's from the first time it was suggested that higher glu glucosinolates in broccoli would be good for you. 26 years for that. The BT cotton story that Liam was talking about took 11 years before it was in the field in the US, but it took 17 years before it got into the field in India where it really made a big difference. The virus-resistant papaya, 13 years. Golden rice, 22 and plus. Submergent tolerant rice, 13 years. These are long-term investments going from original ideas in the lab through to field trials, through to farm use, and then finally through to food. And with that, I will end so we can discuss. So we have plenty of time for discussion. And I, I think the plan is I'll, I'll just say a, f a few things, um, and then we'll have a general discussion. Um, so it's, it's difficult for me to sort of ask you ethical questions about this, because I myself see few ethical issues in it. Um, but the, the nature of ethics, I think, um, it goes something like this. You make a claim like we should develop golden rice or we should develop late blight potatoes and so on, late blight resistant potatoes and so on, and then you give some very good arguments for it. I think you do that. But the other part of ethics is engaging with those who disagree with you. So I, I wonder what ethical arguments or actual arguments your opponents do give for, for the great resistance there are to genetically modified organisms. So I'd, I'd like to know, you know what you think their main objections are and why you think they're mistaken. Uh, so that, that's one question. I'm not saying that there are good objections. I, I can't think of any myself. But uh, they must presumably have some. Now, obviously, there's been a huge resistance in Europe to, to GMOs in general. And, um, and the cases that you raise show that. And I wonder whether you could also reflect on, on the social explanations for that, you know, apart from the, the sort of ethical arguments they give, why it is that, that there are so many obstacles to the development of this. Um, and then I also, um, just as a point of interest, wondered how much of the food that we eat is genetically modified, not in conventional terms of, of crossbreeding, but in terms of genetic engineering, um, just as a point of interest. And the, the last thing I, I wanted to ask you was... I mean, how far can this science go? For example, can we develop new foodstuffs as a at the moment we're introducing genes, we're crossing plants and so on? I'm wondering just how far the enhancement of, of plants and as, as food can go. And secondly, you know, whether it's possible that, there, that this can cross over, um, whether it would be possible to introduce capacities for photosynthesis into, into animals or whether the capacities that plants have can, can cross the animal plan uh, divide. Uh, because there, there are more interesting ethical issues once you start to go higher up outside of plants. But I guess my main, my main sort of challenge to you is to think, you know, if you could give us the sort of strongest objections. And the other thing with ethics is that often when people engage in a discourse, they pick, they pick the arguments that are out there, which are often very weak. Uh, and good ethical analysis is actually building an even stronger version of weak arguments that people are giving and saying, well, you know, what are they trying to get at and can, could we actually give 
a reasonably strong objection uh, to what we're proposing, and how do we respond to that? So I wonder what are the what are the concerns that these people are articulating, and and what's the strongest version of those, and and how would you respond? Can you leave that bit of paper on there if you want to stand? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't taking notes. I don't know. This, it's all just very, very rough. I just. You're going to stand up. I mean, to, to how far can we go with this technologically, and what are the concerns you have, and how would you respond to them? One of the biggest objections is that big companies are going to make a lot of money out of it. And the response, my response to that is that we, that's no different than the pharmaceutical industry. So, you know, that's not an issue related to GM. It's an issue to do, it's an issue to do with how big commercial outfits benefit from advances <coughs> in technology. Yeah. So, so that, that's one that's proving quite difficult to deal with. So I... I over the last 12 years, I've always gauged the public opinion in the pub on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. And in 1999, you know, the pendulum swung that way. Um, where, and in those days, it was possible to raise that issue, but a whole suite of other issues. And now the, many of those issues have been debunked, those objections have been debunked. But that's the one that still uh, um, causes uh, long-term concern. Um, and it's part, you know, it's to do with patent rights and who, who gets to, you know, who owns patent and how they, how freely they make that uh, available. And um, I don't think we've come to uh, a consensus there. But like Jane says, uh, you know, most of the, you know, electronic pieces of equipment that we carry around with us and use every day and don't question necessarily the ethics uh, of, but on the other hand, when it comes to, you know, our GM corn, we're very concerned about it. So I think there's, uh, uh, it's acted as a lightning rod in, in some way. The one I remember you said about how much are we actually eating? Well, if we get a plane to the US, when we fly over there, we're probably eating non-GM on the plane, but when we fly back, we're probably, we will be eating GM. So people don't think about that. I don't think they get their, you know, British Airways flight to New York and they're eating GM on the way back because it's food prepared in New York. Um, the other thing is that 90%, more than 90% of the cattle feed that comes in that's imported into Europe is GM. It's allowed to be GM because it's not for human consumption. Um, but we eat the cattle that eat it. So it's in the food chain, there's no doubt about that. I think it's now 99% of the soybean produced in the world is GM. So anybody eats, who eats soya at any level has probably eaten GM. So it's also easy to discuss this now, or easier than it was in 1999, because uh, a lot of the objections were what-if objections. And you know, as a scientist, you can never say, well, there's a 100% chance that such and such won't happen. You know, there's always a probability that that will happen. And, so, and, and this was taken up by the media as scientists not sure about the future of GM or the safety of GM. And so that played to, uh, to you know, the media in a particular way. And so now it's much easier to argue the, the, the point because there hasn't been ecological meltdown uh, you know, in these areas where it's been, these plants have been grown. And you know, that it hasn't been detrimental in, in any way compared to conventional agriculture. And in terms of cotton production, there are likely to have been environmental benefits so the survey that I uh, responded to, uh, that I mentioned there, uh, which looked at the economic impacts, actually also reported enhanced or improved health of those farmers who spray those fields. So I showed a photograph of a, a farmer spraying pesticides. Now, don't take this as an insult, but evolutionarily, we're all quite closely related to the insects. So whatever uh, kills an insect, will we'll probably do a, a, a good job in your nervous system too. Uh, but none of this has, you know, these environmental catastrophes have come to bear. Uh, so it's easier to win the argument because we've got evidence. Okay, well we should have, general. I just wanted to ask you one last thing. So I'm a, a great support. I wanted to get my children t-shirts when they were small saying I only eat GM. <laughs> uh, I think we should be sort of championing this much more than we are. Um, but one of the concerns I heard, which relates to, to your first sort of public concern about the, the growth of the, the industries around this, somebody mentioned to me that, that Monsanto were at one point introducing terminator genes into their seeds. 
that meant that the plants died each year and they, people had to, I don't know if this is true or not, but so you know, that this meant that farmers then became dependent on Monsanto for, you know, for, their, for their seeds and, and this was a way of actually exploiting people. So this is, obviously when you have a powerful technology you can abuse it. So I wonder whether this is the sort of concern, this was certainly mentioned to me. Um, so one thing with that is, so all of the maize grown in the world, all the corn, is hybrid maize. So by definition, it has to be bought from the suppliers every year. That's non-GM, GM, anything. Hybrid corn has to be bought from the seed suppliers every year. It's the big companies that generate that seed. The other thing about that is that Monsanto's Terminator ads that came out were essentially designed, the Terminator technology was designed so that essentially you couldn't get this um, spread into the environment. And so people got so hooked up on this terminator terminology and said, oh, we don't want terminator genes. And then as soon as that was, you know, Monsanto sort of took it back out of the argument. And then everybody's like, well, what if all these genes spread into the environment? And the very technology that they developed to prevent that happening was essentially shot down, which I have to say was, um, from my perspective, was, you know, bad uh, PR on Monsanto's part. They got that so wrong the way they did it. And if they'd done that a little bit better, then we perhaps wouldn't be where we were. 